This is Greg Denweiler, and you are listening to another episode of The Dividend Mailbox, a podcast about dividend growth. Our goal is to stuff your mailbox full of dividend checks and make each year's check larger than the last. Welcome to the August episode of the Dividend Mailbox. A lot has happened in the last few months. Markets have been volatile. Of course, they always are, most of the time. And we've had a lot of uncertainty. Of course, for the last hundred years, there's always uncertainty. But when we're in the world of dividends, we have more stability, which is part of the whole reason for this podcast. We look at growing dividends, we look at sustainable dividend growth, and we look at the mindset that it takes to invest in a growing dividend portfolio. So this episode, since we have had some volatility, the market you know, at one time was down about 25%. Some of these stocks have been more volatile than the market. What if you got lucky enough and bought right at the bottom? And you now are setting on a position that you purchased just a few months ago, and let's just say it's up 50%. You know, what do you do now? Do you sell it thinking that I might be able to buy it back cheaper because we are far from being through this whole situation? Do you just ignore it? Do you look at a chance, hopefully, maybe that you can buy more or just add to your position as it goes higher? How do you execute this strategy and you make it work for you long term? If you haven't listened to last month's episode, I really would recommend that you go back and listen to the Ronald Reed story because a big part of the answer is right there. But, you know, in dealing with reality and the emotions of, of, of having some success and having a little bit of luck, how do you deal with it and how do you keep yourself on track? That's what I want to hit this, this episode. I think the best way to do it is to look at what's the best way to help you know whether you're actually executing the strategy or not of a growing dividend portfolio. And the best way I can answer that question is we track the dividends. We look at when we're getting dividend increases. We look at the income as it comes in. Um, And the big thing is Each quarter, we want dividend income that's growing. And annually, as I've said many times, maybe too many, you know, we want each year's dividend income to be higher than the last. The best way you do that is just look at your income as it's coming in every month, see the dividends hitting, and go back and look and see when the last dividend increase was. So, right there, you see you know, whether you're really executing the the strategy and you actually see it as it is working out. You want to see one every fourth quarter is the ideal situation. So it's an annual increase. Sometimes they'll stretch it out a little bit longer. But if you get to four quarters and you don't see another dividend increase, it's probably a good time to start looking at the situation to see what's going on there and what the outlook is. And is the stock still going to be on track for dividend growth? The great thing about doing that, it totally takes your attention, your vision off of what market prices are doing towards the what the income is doing in the portfolio. And it helps you keep from being seduced by just prices and what they're doing in the marketplace, which you really can't control. Now, another thing that we haven't really mentioned in the past, or if I did, it was just very briefly. We don't really use dividend, well, we really don't use dividend mutual funds at all. There are mutual funds out there that try to do this same concept. But the problem is, unlike a ETF that pays out all of its income, a dividend mutual fund, they really have a lot of flexibility as to what they pay out, when they pay out, and the timing of it. It's really hard to see, well, am I really growing my income year to year 
the fund may be up 15% a year, but underneath, you don't really know whether the dividend income is growing 3%, 5%, 6%. It may look like it's growing 10 or 15% a year, but they're paying things out that may not necessarily all just be dividend income. It may include some capital gains. It may include dividends. And at some point, there is some discretion for, for fund managers. They don't have to pay out everything. So you're just not quite sure exactly what you're getting at, at the time. So that is one of the big reasons why we don't use dividend mutual funds. I mean, that's not to say that they're bad and they don't work and they, they may even be more profitable over time, depending on the manager and what strategy they use. If they weren't, you know, if they tilt it more towards growth or, or they're just good managers. But the point is, we're tracking income growth, and that's our major definition of success. So in regards to execution and tracking dividend growth, execution is a broad term. If you've listened to the, uh, the episode a few months ago where I interviewed Simeon Hyman from ProShares, he was their, or he is their lead strategist, the interview basically was regarding the ProShares Aristocrat Dividend Fund, otherwise known as Noble. And while I was interviewing him, I had briefly mentioned we had purchased Williams Sonoma. I didn't really go into it. We haven't brought it up since. And this is one of those situations that I'm going to bring out, not to tell you how great we are, but this is really more of just kind of a learning experience you know, how to, how to help look at these to keep your mindset in place and how to keep the portfolio on track long term. Because we bought Williams Sonoma at 108 and it was only down there really for a few days. The stock had sold off fairly dramatically due to a, a negative report from both Target and Walmart. So the entire retail space got hit pretty hard. It came up as a, as just a great value proposition with the dividend growth story. Lo and behold, now it hit 156 today. So in a very short period of time, roughly two months, we're up almost 50% on the stock. And we've already gotten one dividend on it. So what do you do? Markets had a pretty good rebound. Stock has done much better than the market. Do you sell part of it? What's our strategy as far as exiting? Or just how do we execute? And that's really going to point us back to should we even be looking at the fact that the stock's gone up and does that matter at this point? Well, again, I also want to remind you, if you've listened to this podcast at all, you know about Clorox. Um, you know, I'm not going to touch on Clorox except to say it, as of yet, is not the success story that Williams Sonoma is. For every one of them that does really good, you've got some that you've got to be patient with. So I'll go over some of the highlights of, of why we took a position in Williams Sonoma. This is actually one of those stocks that almost checked all the boxes. You don't see these very often. Um, besides the fact that it's retail, that normally I'm not a big fan of retail unless it's a big broad base like um, Target or Walmart, where you don't have the cyclicality or a fad situation like a lot of the clothing. Williams-Sonoma has been around for decades. They're a big brand name. They also own Pottery Barn. But the Williams-Sonoma name is cookware. It's got a reputation of being very high quality. When people get married, they tend, a lot of times, they will use Williams-Sonoma on their wedding registries because people love getting this stuff and it looks good in the kitchen. So it's a great brand name. It's not a fad. It's been around for multiple decades. And not only that, but 20 years ago, the revenue was 1.6 billion. Now it's 8.3 billion. It's up 400%. You've got some real growth there. 20 years ago, they didn't pay a dividend. Ten years ago, the dividend was $0.58, cents, and now it's up to $3.12. So the dividend has been growing by 16% a year for the last 10 years, which is way above our 6% benchmark. So they've really been ramping the dividend up. And they've done all this with 
Currently, they have no debt. I went back and looked going all the way back to 1999. Basically, they have done zero acquisitions. It's all been organic growth. They have virtually no goodwill on the balance sheet. From a profitability standpoint, gross margins are above 40%, which is really good for a retail. Again, you know, they have no debt. Their shares outstanding 10 years ago were 102 million shares, and now they're down to 68 million. They've been buying stock back relatively aggressively. Raising dividend, buying stock back. A lot of times I'm not a huge fan of stock repurchases, but in this case, you get the stock trading at 10 times earnings, and their return on invested capital is up at 25%, and that's the five-year median. If you look lately, the three-year medium is 33% return on capital. It's almost like that number is so high, I'm just going to go with 25%. But it just tells you how well-managed this company is. You know, it's cheap. And in this case, they're doing you a big favor by both paying you a dividend and buying stock back. So you've got a very well-managed business. As soon as the stock market looks like it's not quite as fearful with the whole um, inflation scenario and, you know, are we in a recession? Are we going to go in one, which can hurt retail? But just as a little side note, go back and look at how William Sonoma did back in 2008. And I think it will surprise you. The stock, I'm not going to say is recession resistant, but it does well even in a weak economy. They've transitioned 50% plus over to the internet. They're not as uh, physical store dependent as they used to be. So it's just a great company and the stock has rebounded. So what do you do? Well, this is one thing that I, that I have to throw out is what's more important to you? Is your goal to make money or is it to create wealth? If it's just to make money, if you sell part of this position right now, it's pretty hard to say you've gone wrong because even if it goes higher, you've still got part of the position. If it goes lower, you can buy it back. If it's to create wealth, it's a different mindset. Let's just look at a few scenarios here with William Sonoma. It has $8.4 billion in revenue right now. Their revenue 20 years ago was $1.6 billion. 10 years ago, it was $3.6 billion. The stock has earnings of $15. That is up from five years ago of $3.30. They did have a little bit of a bump from the whole situation where people were staying home. So they put a little bit more emphasis on improving their lifestyle at home. William Sonoma benefited from that. That's calmed down some. But if you look at the earnings estimates for the next few years, Next year, it's $15.75. 2025, it's $16.67. So it looks like they're going to maintain most of that. Well, they're going to maintain all of it and still grow a little bit at the minimum. So let's look at scenario number one. In scenario number one, we're going to call nothing grows except that at the end of 10 years, they pay out 30% of their earnings. Now, in each one of these scenarios, the dividend starts at $3.12, which is where it is currently. So at $3.12 in 10 years, the dividend will have grown to $4.50 if they pay out 30% of that $15 on the 10th year. So if you add up the dividends for the 10-year period, you've got a total of $37. Now, everything else is the same. Stock is still at $150. So you divide the $37 by 10 years and you get roughly a 2.5% yield. Now that doesn't include any compounding, but we're going to just leave that number the way it is because if you bought a 10-year treasury, you've got the same compounding. So we'll just net it out at zero. So it's roughly equivalent to a treasury, 10-year treasury, but slightly below. Well, let's look at scenario number two. And here, we're going to assume that everything stays the same, except that the dividend does grow by 6% a year. 
if you've listened to very many of these podcasts, you know what the line is. But if you haven't, the line is basically what the dividend growth rate has been for the S&P 500 for the last 100 years. And it's 6% a year. So if we use the growth rate of 6% for the dividend of Williams-Sonoma for the next 10 years, the dividend ends up on the 10th year at $5.27. We've gotten a total of, of roughly $41 of dividends, a little higher than, than the nothing gross scenario. And now our 10-year yield is up to 2.7%, but we're still assuming that the stock is valued at the same level of $150. Both of these scenarios are pretty conservative. And we're really expecting not much of anything happening with the, with the company, which has not been the case in the past. This has been a real grower as far as both revenue growth, dividend growth, earnings growth. They're really somewhat negative assumptions. But if we get to the third scenario, we're going to call that the buyback scenario. And again, being very conservative, we're going to assume that the net income does not grow at all. And right now they're earning about $1.1 billion. If you have the $1.1 billion of net income, however, over the 10-year period, you buy back 25% of, your, of their shares with their free cash flow. I have to note, in the past 10 years, they have bought back about 33% of their shares. So even this is a little bit of a conservative estimate. Well, the share count will have dropped by 25%, which will be $51 million. And now you're dividing that same $1.1 billion of net income by fewer shares. So you end up with $22 of earnings. And if you take a 30% payout on that $22 of earnings, basically the normal payout ratio for the last 10 years, then you've got a dividend now that's grown all the way up to $6.70. So over that 10-year period, you've earned a total of $45 of dividends. But here's a couple of assumptions that we're going to make. If those earnings are up to $22, we're going to assume the P.E. ratio is still 10, meaning that for every $1 of earnings, the market's willing to pay $10 for it. So at $22 of earnings, the stock will have grown to $220 as far as what will be its current market price. So there, not only have we earned $45 of dividends, but we've also earned $70 on the stock price, total return of $115. So our 10-year yield has jumped up to 7.5%. Well, now we're going to go to scenario number four. This is the total return scenario, and we really get our cake and our icing too. Now, first of all, I'm going to assume 3% earnings growth. 3% seems very realistic, and it's way below the last 10 years growth rate of 22% a year. And then we're going to make one more assumption, that they continue to buy back shares also. But we're going to use the same 25% share repurchase rate, and that gets us back down to just like the last scenario, they'll have about 51 million shares outstanding if that's the case. Here's, here's where the big leverage comes in and in, in the compounding effect and how dividend growth can really pay off. So now the net income will have grown to 1.5 billion in 10 years. Not a big number, but it's 3% growth of earnings. So the 1.5 billion you divide it by that lower share count, which is now down to 51 million, and now you've got $30 of earnings. If you take the 30% payout, you have a $9 dividend. So over the 10-year period, we just basically average that out. You've earned a total of $53 of dividends. But we're going to make one more assumption. Now, if you've got a company it's grown from $15 to $30 in, in earnings in 10 years, the odds are that the market is going to evaluate that a little differently and they're going to put a higher premium on it. And we're just going to assume that the PE is now 15, which is markets paying $15 for every $1 of earnings. 
So you take $30 times 15. Now the stock price has grown all the way to $450. You add in the uh, extra $53 of dividends. You have a total ending value at that point of $500 between the stock and the dividends that you've received. So you've got a gain of $350 on, on your original $150 investment of what it's worth right now. Over a 10-year period, that's 230% gain. So you've got a pretty dramatic success story here. We haven't even gotten into the fact that 3% earnings growth is relatively conservative. And with those kind of earnings and no long-term debt, if you have a balance sheet that's that conservative, it's quite possible they're going to be able to buy back more shares, earnings grow faster. Williams Sonoma has the capability or the possibility of really being a huge winner. The company has performed much better than this scenario in the past, but it's a retail stock right now with the threat of a recession. They're just not willing to pay much for the earnings right now. But that's where you get the opportunity to get into a situation like this at a much more reasonable price. And if you go back a, a year or two, this stock has been up in the low 200s. So the market has valued it in the past much higher than they're currently valuing it. But this is the dividend growth story playing out. You want a whole portfolio of these kinds of situations, and, and usually you don't get one that's quite this good. You know, is there a guarantee that you're gonna that you're gonna hit the cake and the icing scenario? Um, no, there never is. But if you have several of these, the odds are that you hit one of them starts to go up dramatically. I think it'll compete with any portfolio out there with very few exceptions of these really high growth tech or or you know more of venture capital type stories but i don't think you really give up anything so where does that leave us executing the strategy you don't give something up just because it's moved and price is a very seductive thing it tends to to get you to start to think well maybe i should protect part of that profit but what I hope you take away from this is don't let price seduce you. Take a look at what you still think the dividend can grow by. If the potential dividend growth outweighs the short-term gain that you have achieved, why do you want to interrupt that? And one of the reasons why we brought this up and a big piece of why uh, what this podcast is about is what happens when things really work well? I mean, how do you how do you manage this strategy for the long term? When we first bought it, we had a pretty much a margin of safety on every one of these four scenarios. And now the margin of safety is much less, obviously, because the stock is up. But on the fourth scenario, the upside on on, on Williams Sonoma is fairly dramatic even from this price. Because of that, there just really isn't a reason to sell it. And if the stock does does drop back off again, I don't think you should look at it as, oh, I had a chance to make some quick money and I could turn around and rebuy it or redeploy the money. It's more of an issue that we didn't take a full position on it initially, so it gives us a chance to uh, to buy more or even reinvest some of the dividends it may have accumulated, depending on how long it takes before it drops back off again. Every investor has some bias, and one of our biases is if something moves really fast, we start to step back and say, well, maybe we should take another look. Really, what we're after here is before we want to start making another commitment to the, to the stock at this price is to relook at our scenario, and maybe we just underestimated it when we first started to buy it. We may decide to, to add to it at this point. But at the moment, we'll see how things develop. You know, one of the things you have to keep in mind, every, every time you sell something and buy something, it's a decision. Every time you make a decision, it's just giving you another chance to be wrong. So when you find a company that's well-managed, it's allocating capital well, that looks really at the shareholder's best interest, you really want to try to hang on to it as long as you can 
you kind of ask yourself, are you trying to make money or are you trying to build wealth? And I hope that helps you in looking at how you actually execute the dividend growth strategy. If you don't know how to do it yourself, some of these ETFs are designed to do it. Noble is one of them. And if you want an individual stock portfolio, we are investment advisors that this is what we do. We'd love to talk to you. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to next month's. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a review and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. If you would like more information regarding dividend growth or just our style of investing, go to growmydollar.com. There you will find some of our previous podcasts and also our monthly newsletter. If you have any questions or anything to add regarding today's podcast, email ethan at growmydollar.com. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Each investor should consider whether a strategy is right for them and all the risk involved. Dividend stocks are volatile and can lose money.